Thank you very much, Art. Uh, a pleasure to be in this uh, close to final session. We still have an, an extraordinary one for the end, but uh, and and to debate with uh, Dimitri. So uh, I have conflict of interest, uh, which I showed yesterday. But I think the biggest one for me today is that for many years I've been trying to promote synchrony and saying, well, synchrony is really what we would like to achieve and we are doing bad jobs. So what I'm going to show you is that there are circumstances where maybe asynchrony ca can be interesting. So, so why do, do we want synchrony and patient breathing spontaneously? Many reasons for that. We, we know from uh, many uh, studies that sedation is bad. Uh, and if you can use uh, no sedation, uh, you have better outcome from the ICU, you have better long-term outcomes. So that's really an important goal. So, and no sedation goes with uh, more spontaneous breathing for sure. And uh, we've discussed that at length. And this audience is, I'm sure, convinced that there are many good reasons why uh, we, we'd like to keep spontaneous breathing to preserve respiratory muscle function, so to avoid myotrauma. Hope you know this term now. And, uh, and also to, to uh, re, re irate reopen some parts of the lung which are not moving at all when the diaphragm is not moving, uh, which may turn into improved VAQ relationship and the regional ventilation. So that's really the goal of, of many of us now. And we have been shocked by this data, really. Well, if you give neuromuscular blocker to every ARDS patient during 48 hours, which we knew was bad, you improve survival. Wow, that's a shock. And, uh, and I think uh, that's very important data to try to think what, what, what's wrong when that uh, even given the, the worst treatment, paralysis, improve outcome. So that's completely the opposite of uh, trying to promote spontaneous breathing. So Art Slutsky, which I'm sure was shocked, uh, tried to, to find the, what, what could be the hypothesis, what could be the explanation for that. And uh, it has to do, because you block, it's not the drug by itself. Uh, what you do is really you block spontaneous breathing activity. And very likely, you avoid the synchrony between uh, what the ventilator is doing and what the patient is doing, or, and or you avoid large transpulmonary pressure swings, which mean the patient breathing at the same time that the ventilator is delivering the pressure. So we, we don't know what's, which one is, is uh, the worst, but both may cause the volutrauma and, and the consequences in terms of patient survival. So that's really a big issue. And uh, we, it's, it's an hypothesis, but we have some surrogate markers which indicate this is the case. Uh, in the group of patients who received neuromuscular blocker, there were three times less pneumothorax at 48 hours, so very likely, again, less hyperinflation or at electroma, we don't know exactly, but uh, really supporting the hypothesis that uh, this spontaneous breathing is not good. Uh, and, and this is not uh, a, a data coming out of the blue sky. The, this group, uh, it was their third study, because they, they initially wanted to show that neuromuscular blockers were bad. And uh, the preceding study, they had also some biological signals in patients with neuromuscular blocker. It's, it's a different study. It's a different group of patients. But the, the signals was uh, that uh, markers of inflammation are, uh, were lower after 
48 hours of neuromuscular blockers compared to the group with placebo. So it's really consistent, and we really should ask ourselves, uh, well, is, is that the best method? And anyway, we have to explore that because we cannot give neuromuscular blockers for very long time. And, and we would like to avoid giving it to a, every patient with ARDS. Uh, we now have some uh, experimental models confirming that the combination of spontaneous breathing and mechanical ventilation, so that's what we describe as high transpulmonary pressure. So you see it's the addition of the pressure given by the ventilator plus the pressure developed by the respiratory muscles. So that would be spontaneous breathing on top of uh, severe lung injury. Uh, this group at least show that for a model of severe lung injury, uh, compared to no spontaneous breathing, you have much more inflammation locally. Uh, and therefore, these high transpulmonary pressure swings created by both ventilator pressure plus patient spontaneous breathing activity uh, may be responsible for what we should call now ventilation-induced lung injury, not ventilator, ventilation in total. So that's really a big concern, at least for this group of patients. Uh, and, and you know, especially because we tend to use very frequently modes of ventilation like pressure control modes, uh, there, are, there are difference between volume control and pressure control, but uh, in terms of gas exchange, it can be used uh, interchangeably. Uh, one of the big difference in, is that in volume control, when the patient is doing an active effort, uh, if the ventilator is working properly and if he's controlling the volume, the airway pressure go, uh, is um, changed to the same extent that the amount of uh, negative pleural pressure. So if you compute the difference between the two, which is the transpulmonary pressure, the transpulmonary pressure is controlled. It's not changed by active effort. In fact, it's not always true because volume control ventilation do not completely control volume, but that's the principle. In pressure control, the principle is that this transpulmonary pressure is not controlled because if the patient is doing an active effort, the job of the ventilator is to control the pressure. And so you completely lose the information about what's the, the distending pressure of the lung just looking at the airway pressure because you don't know what's the, the other part of the equation. So in these pressure control modes, which we use a lot, especially because we think they are more comfortable for the patient, uh, it's easier for the patient to take the tidal volume uh, he or she wants, uh, then this could be a problem. The, the combination of patient's effort at the same time the patient, the ventilator is delivering the breath. I said the same time, which means in synchrony. So that's my point here. Uh, and then we have to look a little bit in details about uh, the technical aspect of the pressure control mode. Uh, you have a lot of these modes with very different names, from pressure assist to uh, BiPAP, uh, Duopap, PCV+, uh, many very confusing uh, names, changing from one ventilator to the other. In general, most of these modes, almost all but not all, uh, in fact, keep their expiratory valve open all the time. And the advantage of that is that at any time, whether it's at the high pressure or low pressure, it allows the patient to, to, to take spontaneous breathing effort on top of the pressure delivered by the ventilator. So you're more or less like having two CPAP levels, if you wish. So again, it's not for every mode, but for most of the modes. The issue is that, so, so just changing from a low level to a high level, you have pressure control ventilation, and patient can breathe uh, when he or she wants. Uh, the big issue is that uh, the company has decided that uh, 
they, they listen to the different meetings and they say, oh, synchrony seems to be good. So they try to synchronize everything. And they put trigger windows, but both for inspiration and for expiration. A trigger window means that the ventilator knows he's supposed to deliver a breath at a given frequency, but there is a window during which the ventilator is expecting that there will be a signal from the patient trying to synchronize the increase in pressure or synchronize the decrease in pressure for expiration. So most of the modes we use are synchronized. The only one which is not synchronized, and again I apologize because this is a major source of confusion, is the mode called APRV, uh, which is purely two levels of CPAP with no synchronization. Why is it another source of confusion? It's because APRV, the initial name, meant that you use a high pressure for a long time and from time to time you release the pressure. The initial idea between this mode was using high level of CPAP where it's very difficult to breathe. If you, if you try that, you will see. So from time to time, there was a release in the pressure to increase alveolar ventilation. But in fact, you can use this mode on ventilators like a standard pressure control mode with normal TI, normal TE. Uh, and it's the only one which is not synchronized with patient effort. So in a bench study, which we did with Jean-Christophe Richard, we say, let's compare uh, the same pressure settings on the ventilator, so same PEEP, same high pressure, and let's simulate exactly the same patient's effort. And let's compare a mode where there is no synchronization, like APRV, a mode like partial synchronization, like press, assist pressure control SIMV, or a mode which is fully synchronized, like assist pressure control, the mode which is the most frequently used uh, nowadays. Uh, and in fact, it's easy to understand. If, for instance, you start with no patient's effort for a given pressure, delta pressure, you, you will get uh, this volume, for instance, uh, the 6 ml per kilogram predicted body weight that you're targeting for your patient. If you now synchronize every breath, every breath will be increased, at least on the simulator, by the amount of effort done by the patient. And if the patient is, is doing the same effort, maybe every breath will be 10 milliliters per kilogram of predicted body weight. So the advantage of having a non-synchronized mode could be that, uh, well, from time to time, you will have patient's effort at the same time that the patient delivered breath, but Although, uh, in between, you will have a small tidal volume done by the patients or intermediate tidal volume, and it may be easier to control the average tidal volume at your targeted uh, um, level. So we did an extensive uh, bench study, which uh, uh, was published, and uh, comparing uh, APRV, pressure, pressure control SIMV, if you wish, and uh, assist pressure control. And not surprisingly, we found that uh, the higher the synchronization, the higher the tidal volume. So if you start with a tidal volume of six uh, and you go to assist pressure control, you get all the time a tidal volume of eight or, or more. Um, we, one thing which, uh, of course, was uh, obvious and which we did not realize initially is that uh, at the same time you increase synchrony, you increase tidal volume, but you also decrease variability. Of course, because you tend to have every breast supported in the same way. So, say maybe that's not good because we want protective lung ventilation, we want some variability, uh, and using a fully synchronized mode, it may be the worst uh, thing to do. So in, in this paper, we also had some data from patients which were in accordance with the bench study. But we say we need uh, to repeat exactly the same uh, 
measurement in patients because what we did not have in our bench study was a, a simulation of the control of breathing. So in uh, St. Michael's Hospital with uh, Nutapol Retire EMI and the help of uh, many people in the ICU, including uh, people from the respiratory therapy uh, department of St. Michael, many of them are here, yeah, hello. Uh, we, we did this study in uh, comparing PCV assist, so every breast is uh, supported by uh, delta pressure to PCV SIMV and to APRV. And it was the same patient, of course, and it was exactly the same setting. So same high pressure, same PEEP, same backup respiratory rate, which was about 20. So the difference was only the synchronization with the patient, and this is an example in one patient. So where you have fully synchronized uh, pressure, uh, assist pressure control, you have pre uh, SIMV pressure control or APRV where there is no synchronization. And uh, in terms of minute ventilation, in terms of oxygenation, in terms of CO2, there was absolutely no difference. It was 20, 30 minutes period. Uh, what was different and as expected was the fact that with APRV, the tidal volume was significantly lower than with, uh, sorry for the name, that was the, but it's PCV SIMV, and significantly lower than PCV assist. Uh, if you express that in milliliters per kilogram, for instance, uh, and if you wish to have a protective ventilation, you, we were always below six with APRV, above six here and close to uh, at seven or more with the um, assisted mode. Uh, so again, we, we almost repeated the bench uh, data because the tidal volume progressively decreased when synchronization was absent and variability of the tidal volume, which we, we have said may be important, uh, increased. So uh, in terms of the transpulmonary pressure, uh, whether you look at uh, the maximal, the mean value, uh, it was significantly lower. So I, I look at my slides to be sure I put PL for transpulmonary pressure. Um, so which means that you achieve a more protective ventilation using this non-synchronized mode. So everything looks good. Except that uh, if the tidal volume was lower and the minute ventilation was the same, it means that the patients had a higher respiratory rate and it was significantly higher. And that was associated with a higher drive to breathe and a higher work of breathing uh, measured here from uh, the uh, pressure time product of the respiratory muscles. So you see the P.1, which we recorded on the ventilator as an indicator of respiratory drive. So more protective ventilation, but price to pay, which is a bit higher work of breathing for the patients. But what was very interesting is that, in fact, we have half of our patients were under sedation, and half of our patients had no more sedation, uh, which can be used at a relatively early phase of ARDS. In fact, that's what we are currently doing in a multicenter trial uh, we have in France uh, using this mode of ventilation. And you see here an example where we set initially the pressure to get the minimal ventilation we need. And we accept on top of that uh, spontaneous breathing by the patient. So this trial uh, is, is ongoing. We, it's planned for 700 patients. It's compared to assist control ventilation. We are, we are something like half of the enrollment rate. Uh, and this is, again, an example where we start with paralysis for every patient, and then we switch to this mode, allowing the patients to have some spontaneous breathing. We are not looking for increase improving gas exchange with the spontaneous breathing, but just to let the respiratory muscle work. So what we hope and uh, 
expect is that uh, this asynchronous ventilation uh, could be an interesting compromise to achieve two important goals for mechanical ventilation, being lung protective on one side, so not seeing the, the negative aspect of the uh, control group of the Papazian trial, and also maintaining spontaneous breathing activity for all the reasons we've discussed today. So um, for this situation, and I think it illustrates to me the fact that th there is no universal truth. We have to think case by case, and, and priorities are not the same at the different time of uh, ICU care. At that time, maybe a completely asynchronous ventilation may be the best way to ventilate these patients. And I kept this final slide for Leo, uh, using physiology to personalize uh, mechanical ventilation. Thank you very much.